First up, I'd like to introduce Ed Struzik. Ed's love for the North began early, even before he'd even moved there in the early 1970s. And the love came mostly through reading books. This love to let, led him to eventually paddling more than 35 rivers in the Yukon, Alaska, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. And this serious thirst for adventure has led to some exciting encounters with wildlife. We were just having a quick conversation beforehand about polar bears, and I know I have some more questions for him. Um, and it sounds like some close calls in bush flying as well. It's only appropriate that his love for the North started through reading books, and lucky for us, he now shares his adventures through writing and through photography. So please help me welcome Ed Struzik. <laughs> I'm going to do something a little bit different here. Um, I'm going to tell you about a book that I was asked to write uh, a few years ago by my publisher in Washington, D.C., uh, which asked me the question, what will the Arctic look like in 50 years, you know, because of climate change and other factors? And um, at the time, I thought that's it's an impossible book to write. But then when I thought about it, uh, I realized that no one is going to be able to prove me wrong because in 50 years, I'm not going to be here. So I thought this, this could be fun. And so what I'm going to do here is do a little bit of what David Pelly did earlier on, is to describe the process of how I wrote this book and where it took me. So it's a bit of a photographic tour and an explanation of how the book came to be. And uh, the first question that came in, in my mind is, what is Arctic? Is it everything within the Arctic Circle? Is it places where monthly temperatures do not exceed 10 degrees Celsius, that line you see there? Is it regions with continuous permafrost? If so, then what about places like Churchill, Manitoba, where you've got you know, a huge congregation of polar bears, 1,200 of them on the, uh, uh, at 58 degrees north? Uh, and what about some place like Wrangell, St. Elias, in the southwestern U U Yukon and uh, Alaska, which is the biggest subpolar ice field in the world? Then you got what really confounds things is northern Ellesmere Island where you have up to 65 frost-free days and as Mark Serez, a climatologist, once quipped, uh, one can conce conceivably grow lettuce there and they have at the Eureka Weather Station. Uh, so I, I thought from there I'm going to try to describe or just uh, tell myself, well, what do we know about the Arctic? You know, we know it's half ocean, half land, much of it is covered, covered in glaciers and ice caps. Uh, the Arctic is dotted with polynias. Uh, those are those open bodies of water surrounded by ice that rarely freeze over in the wintertime. And this is where polar bears and beluga whales and narwhal and other marine mammals go. Otherwise, they would die. Uh, it's tundra and alp alpine valleys. It's sparsely forested in some places, such as here in Ivivik National Park on the Alaska-Yukon border. And what I like about the Arctic uh, most is that it's weird and it's wonderful. You know, there's no place like the Cirque of the Unclimbables uh, in the Mackenzie Mountains, which is now, this is now part of Nahani National Park. In the, along the Horton River in the Western Arctic, you have the Smoking Hills, which have been burning for 10,000 years, uh, creating an entirely different landscape from the tundra around it. Uh, and then up on northern Ellesmere Island on the glaciers, you have extremophiles living under 200 feet of ice. And we know that because they're flushing gaseous hot springs out through these geysers. And if you were there, if, when I was there and there was not a wind blowing, those two scientists would be dead because of the hydrogen sulfide. So there's something deep down that's percolating and having a really good time in the Arctic, but we have no idea what they are. The Arctic is also river deltas, the Mackenzie, which is comprised of 45,000 lakes, uh, the Yukon Kuskokum Delta in uh, Alaska, which is home to 500,000, half a million shorebirds nesting there in uh, the spring and summer. We've got the Peace Athabasca, which, you know, maybe technically not Arctic, but it is north of 60. It's one of the biggest freshwater deltas in the world. Uh, and Many of you here know the Arctic is clean, fresh water. Fresh water. The Mackenzie River, the longest river in Canada, the Hood River on the, in Nunavut, which is 400 kilometers long, 
the Horton River, 850 kilometers long, the South Nahani, the Firth River in Alaska, which is short, very exciting river to paddle, and the back, I know uh, Dave Pelly's uh, done this river, um, I think for personal reasons, uh, actually many, many years ago, which just has uh, an unprecedented number of rapids and small waterfalls along the way. It's, uh, it's really, truly a spectacular river. Uh, and then, you know, over in places like Chukotka, we have also very fresh, clean rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean, the Anudar River in Chukotka, which I visited a couple of years ago. The Brown River, the reversing waterfalls of Wager Bay and Ukuk Siksalik. Uh, Great Slave Lake, the deepest lake in North America. Now think about it. I mean, most of these rivers, save the exception of the Mackenzie, which has really got a lot of silt in it. I mean, most, you know, you, you can dip your cup into the water and drink and without the real fear that you're going to contract something terrible. And you just think that where, what other place in the world can you do this? So we have something special in, in the Arctic. And of course, these Arctic rivers and lakes produce big fish in unexploited areas such as Great Bear Lake. This 45 kilogram, this was not a record. There has been bigger fish caught in that lake. Um, the Arctic, is, as we all know, is wildlife uniquely adapted to the cold, such as Piri caribou, which are about this high in size, the barren ground, woodland, mountain caribou, musk ox, Arctic fox, Arctic wolves, and then the little barren ground grizzly bears, which are about two-thirds of the size of the grizzly bears that we see in the Rocky Mountains, and probably a third of the size of the Kodiak bears that you see in Alaska. And of course, we've got polar bears, probably the most iconic of Arctic species. And these predators eat Arctic hare, ground squirrels, lemmings uh, that you find all across the Arctic, the kind of, that's your, that's your, 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 your kibbles for the, for the bigger critters. And some live, birds that we know live in the Arctic year-round, such as the ivory gull, snowy owl, long-tailed jaeger, the skua, king eiders, uh, and then we have millions of birds that migrate to the Arctic in spring, like the red-throated loon, Arctic terns, sandhill cranes, and one of the rarest birds of all, the whooping crane. There are only about 200 left in the wild. But the definition really isn't good enough, and again, I'm, I keep repeating, summing up what David Pelly was saying, but the Arctic is people, and I think that this is what we tend to forget that you can't define Arctic simply by wildlife, by the Arctic Ocean, by glaciers, by all of those other things. The Arctic is all people which are part of the landscape, part of the myth, part of the history, and it's really important to understand that. They're the Dene, Métis, Gwich'in, the Inuit, the Inuvialuit and Yupik, the Chukotkans of northern Russia, and I think you could include the Sami reindeer herders of Scandinavia. And to them, they view this Arctic world in a much different way than we do. They have a different way of seeing this world. Some of it is sinister, uh, you know, places where there are sinister spirits inhabited, other places where on the Thelon, in the Thelon River area, the place where God began for the people who live in Lutzel Cay. Uh, this is, this is their, their beginnings are in this world that we want to explore for uranium and oil and gas and other things. And in, Again, Ukuk Siksalik, we heard as well that they, there are evil spirits there, but the Inuit also believe that this is their version of their garden, even Eden, because it's in, ripe with marine mammals and caribou. It's really an astonishing uh, place. Uh, and also on the Nahani River, the spirit Namadaza lives at Rabbit Kettle Hot Springs. He guards against uh, what the Dene of that part of the world felt, uh, believed were giant beavers that roamed the countryside, and if they slapped their tail, they would drown fishermen. And so he was a good spirit that lived in these vents of these hot springs. Um, the truth is we, non-native people, have our own myths and beliefs about the Arctic that started, you know, long ago, but, you know, first documented by the Greeks who believed that Arctic, Arctos was the world that lay beneath the constellation of stars known as Great Bear, and that Boreas, the god of the wind, was the spirit or god who was responsible for winter coming to more southern climates. When he breathed or coughed in the fall time, that was a signal that winter cold air was coming. And those people, 
of that time and later believed that this wor mythical world was situated along an open polar sea populated by a group of people called Hyperboreans. And they even wrote poetry about it. And this was a place where the sun shone 24 hours a day. Uh, there were maidens dancing and flutes playing. It was kind of their version of heaven. And uh, we think that's kind of quaint, you know, that this is myth. Um, like, like, the, the, like the Denny myth of the, great bear, of the, of the giant beavers. Uh, but the fact is, scientists believed in an open polar sea well into the 20th century. And if you really look at it, the search for the Northwest Passage or the search for an Arctic Passage across the North Pole, you know, occurred over a 500-year period um, where they believed many cases that if you went far enough north, the heat of the sun would melt the water and then you would have a free sailing going over to the Orient. And of course, we know this, what happened with that flawed, view, that flawed scientific view. More than 150 ships tried and failed to find the open polar sea during that time. And we have, the Arctic is littered with examples of these kinds of tragedies. But the fact is, the Greeks were right in the way. And now we're starting to get where my book starts after I've sort of defined the, the, the landscape for myself. Um, on Axel Heiberg Island, which is right next to Ellesmere Island in the very, very far uh, high part of the Arctic, in 1985, there's a helicopter pilot that flew over it, saw trees sticking out of the ground, tr big tree trunks sticking out of the ground, went back, told scientists, don't believe them until they went back the next year, and found out, yes, there were tree tr trees sticking out of the ground, and some of them were really, really big trees. Uh, they're from a dawn redwood forest that existed 45 million years ago. And this perfectly, perfectly preserved fossil forest, you know, even had spruce cones, fresh seeds and nuts, and amber. Uh, and the scientist that was excavating this stuff, when he first reported it, it made Time magazine in 1985. And this was, I think, right around the time that the movie Jurassic Park came. And he had essentially shut down publicity because there were so many crazy people trying to get amber from him because they believed if they found a mosquito in there they could somehow extract DNA. And that was the end of the story for about 20 years where he just went out excavating without trying to draw any attention to himself. So was it an anomaly? Uh, you know, m most scientists did think, you know, that at some place it was very warm for a very long time. But now because of evidence that we found on Devon Island at the Houghton Crater, we know it was warm 23 million years ago because we know that these critters, brontotheres, lived there at that time. We also know that on Ellesmere Island four and a half million years ago, there were also beavers living in that part, that part of the world because there are sticks with the imprint of a beaver on it. And, uh, but these beavers happen to be miniature beavers, which were about a third the size of the beavers that we have now. And on Banks Island, we know that four million years ago, there was a spruce forest there because we still have some of those spruce trunks eroding out of the ground from that time. Uh, and seven, 750,000 years ago, uh, we had three-toed horses roaming northern Banks Island. We also had camels at that time and all kinds of really interesting crit critters. And surprise, but no real surprise, those stories about giant beavers, what we thought were myths for so long, were actually true. There were eight foot long, 100 kilogram beavers in the northern Yukon. And in fact, Dick Harrington, the guy that unearthed the miniature beavers, also unearthed or found evidence of these giant beavers. And how did he do it? The Denny, or the Gwich'in, uh, of Old Crow, an elder, led him to the spot on Whitestone Creek. This is where there were giant beavers. Okay, so we know that probably for the last, most of the last 100 million years ago, the Arctic was a pretty warm place, capable of sustaining a lot, rich variety of wildlife. But then it started getting progressively colder. And then those glaciers that we saw started forming, you know, up in the, high, up in the mountains above those beaver pond sites. And the camels that once roam here, they started moving out. They disappeared three and a half million years ago. We had short-faced bears that disappeared 20,000 years ago. And the woolly mammoths that we thought disappeared 10,000 years ago basically hung on, we think, now to 4,000 years ago. They just could not take those swings in temperature from hot to cold. And so what we're left with, and of course, we, we, we almost lost bison. 
they disappeared from Alaska, the Yukon, and Northwest Territories and, uh, around 400 years ago um, and only survived in the wood bison that we know of in an area around Wood Buffalo National Park. Uh, but okay, so we had this intense period of cold that occurred over the last million years and really started wiped out the Arctic as it was, would have been known had be, we'd been around at that time. So what's happening now that the Arctic is warming? You know, we know that sea ice is melting. We've got less than half of the winter ice that we had um, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, the glaciers are thinning, and if they all melt, the seas would rise by about 70 meters. That's not going to happen anytime soon, but the nor so western Arctic is very quickly sinking into the sea. Glaciers are retreating. This 1980 li line that you can see there, that picture was taken to me when I worked in Kalani National Park in 1980. We've got permafrost thawing, sea levels rising, and storms now are picking up steam. We've got Arctic communities are sliding into the sea, and increasingly, Narwa and Beluga are getting maybe tricked, is not the best word, but they're staying longer than they perhaps should be because of warm ambient temperatures and warm water and not anticipating that the winter will come back very quickly. And so in the last decade, we had many, many examples of hundreds uh, of beluga whales and narwhal essentially just getting stuck in these small holes and the Inuit end up uh, harvesting them, otherwise that they would die and be left to waste. We've got melting glaciers are flooding some rivers now in the Arctic at uh, different times, but when there are no more glaciers and less snowpack, those rivers and deltas, for example, in the Mackenzie Delta, there's one a group of scientists that predict that 15,000 of them will disappear by 2050. They will dr literally dry up by then because there will be not enough water flowing down the Mackenzie to overflow its banks. And a lot of the rivers that uh, you people here canoe will no longer be canoeable or won't be canoeable for as long as you, know, you might hope. The wind, oh, window of opportunity will be closing on many of these rivers, such as the Thompson. I was going to include a picture of the Bernard, which we tried to do several years ago, which is on, on, the, on, the, on Banks Island, uh, but we ran out of water after three days. Uh, there just wasn't enough, it was one of those very mild springs, the snow melted very, very quickly, and the river just dried up on us. The Nuuk Nuuk River, the upper part of the Natla River, if anybody's done the Natla, you know that it's a big slide, there's a lot of little boulder gardens along the way. It's going to be a very difficult river to paddle. Uh, you're probably going to have to drag your canoes a long way down the Snake River and the Wind River, perhaps, before you get enough water that you can hop in with all your gear in it. Um, if it continues warm, we're going to see more southern species moving north. We know now that red fox are outcompeting uh, Arctic fox in many parts of the Arctic. We've seen grizzly bears now moving into western Hudson Bay and on the high Arctic islands. And in some cases, we know that they're killing them, such as here on western Hudson Bay. Uh, grizzly had, grizzlies hadn't been seen on western Hudson Bay for a long, long time. Uh, we also know that they're not only killing them, but grizzlies are mating with polar, polar bears, and this is a picture of a polar bear grizzly hybrid. We've got deer now moving into the Arctic, and cougars and mountain lions are following. There have been 45 mountain lion sightings in the last 10 years in, in the Arctic, including one on the Lowell Glacier, which I showed you uh, recently. We've had coyotes reaching the Arctic coast at Kuglukduk, which is just almost unheard of. And some of these southern animals will bring disease to the Arctic, such as rabies or distemper. Beluga whales and narwhal, we have no, have no immunity to focine distemper, which is really fairly common at mid-latitudes. Mid and the big concern is if, they, if one of these carriers migrates north and infects a population of, say, a thousand at, uh, at, on Somerset Island, off the coast of Somerset Island, you'll have massive die-offs. Um, as we heard earlier, fire is now becoming a part of the landscape. As temperatures on land increase, forest fires will burn bigger, hotter, and faster. The tree line is going to move north. The tundra regions will increasingly disappear, will be a smaller and smaller part of the Arctic, and this is going to take its toll on caribou. We're probably going to lose peri caribou at some point. We've already now had seen a decline of 15 of the 23 barren ground caribou herds uh, in the circumpolar world are now in a, a major decline. 
And as sea ice continues to melt, many polar bears will be forced to sport, spend more time on land. Uh, this is a picture of bears that actually got all the way to Great Bear Lake into the community of Delaney. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Or they'll have to travel farther to find ice in order to hunt seals. And this is really going to tax their energy reserves. And we know that acts of cannibalism appear to be increasing uh, in polar bear regions across the Arctic. There's just two, there's now three weeks on both sides of spring and fall where the bears have now got to fast for longer periods. And hungry bears we know are problem bears. Uh, and we know this is a classic example of uh, the Churchill in the 1980s had to build a jail for bears because they were killing as many as 35 bears in the hungry bears in the community each year. Um, and it becomes a very, very expensive trying process that's hard on the bears and, you know, I think hard on the community as well because they've staked their future on that uh, polar bear tourism industry. Uh, one estimate, a blue ribbon panel that was appointed by uh, former the George W. Bush government predicted that two-thirds of our polar bears will probably disappear by 2050. They're not going to go extinct, but they're going to disappear. But not anim all animals are going to suffer. Bear ground grizzly bears will likely do well uh, because more food means healthier bears. These guys are a lot smaller. They don't need to put on as much weight. Uh, more cubs. Uh, they won't have to hibernate as long. Muskox are going to do well. So too are bison. Squirrels are now producing two, three, two litters a year. Uh, melting sea ice is also going to create economic opportunities in the form of oil and gas. Uh, the question is, if there is a race for the Arctic, how is that going to define the future map of the Arctic? What is it going to look like? What will this mean for the Arctic people? On the one hand, it's pipelines and prosperity, mines and money. But imagine this scenario, and I'll sum this up pretty quickly here. As the Exxon Valdez likes oil spill occurred, say, in Lancaster Sound, when beluga whales are migrating into the region, and walrus have hauled out onto shore, and the polar bears are concentrated on the sea ice or the receding ice flows, searching for seals, which are hunting for fish, and you have a powerful cyclone coming in, one of these extreme weather events we're seeing increasingly in the summer months in the Arctic, uh, and the support planes are either grounded because of weather or because of their fighting fires down south. There are no Arctic ports from which to stage a cleanup or to manage the situation. Birds and wildlife will become soaked in oil. Dead fish are going to wash up on shore. Birds of prey will feed on these poison carcasses. So that was the question that the book tries to answer. So what's the future going to look like? Uh, science can help us cr create a roadmap to the future to give us a, no a view what's, of what's going to happen, and so can traditional knowledge. But it's not going to be easy, not unless we invest more in the Arctic, um, because it's not easily understood. And I'll finish off with this sequence of shots here. This is off the Kujua River on Victoria Island. My wife and I did this uh, a number of years ago, and we didn't see these on the map, but these hills we're about eight kilometers away, and it was a beautiful night, and we decided, let's go hike over there and have a look at them, because they were sort of mesmerizing there on the horizon, and they weren't on the map, and we just wanted to, to investigate. So along the way, we started walking, and we asked ourselves, well, how high are they? Halfway, we got four kilometers away, and we kept saying to yourself, how high do you think they are? Now think in your own mind, how high do you think they are? You don't have to shout it out, but think about it. Okay, now we're two kilometers away. How high do you think they are now? We're now one kilometer away. 100 meters away. This is how high they are. <laughs> and so I get back to the original question, what the future Arctic is, is that it's not well under understood. We have a certain way of seeing I think, you know, that that demonstrates is that we can be easily fooled, that we bring our baggage, our way of seeing the Arctic world to the north, and I think that it's an inherently a very flawed one, and that's why I think there has to be this melding of traditional Inuit and Dene knowledge and scientific knowledge to actually allow us to see the Arctic more clearly. Thank you very much.